Uh, Father, welcome to St. John's. Thank you. It was a pleasure to have you. You've been here almost uh, a week. Yeah, about a week now. Yeah. yeah. And uh, <clears throat> we uh, have started just recently, unfortunately, uh, this uh, we interview sessions with, with people of interest and people who come from different parts of the world. Mm -hmm. uh, we Not too long ago, we had uh, Archimandrite Niktari from Mexico City. Oh, yeah. We have a small monastery there. He gave a, he gave a very interesting talk on orthodoxy in that country. Mm -hmm. And of course, you uh, come from a distant land in the Balkans. Yes. Um, Kosovo. Kosovo, yes. Um, which we consider to be Serbia, but uh, anyway, I'm not going to go there. Yeah. Uh, uh, but uh, you were born in this country. Could yeah. you tell us a little bit about your background, where you were born, where you uh, became a monastic? How, how were you born as an Orthodox Christian? Were you? No, you know, I was born in the Seattle area. Um, and when I was 14, you know, just by chance, I found The Way of the Pilgrim in a bookstore. Ah. And the translation by French. Uh, I don't know. It was the one that has an introduction by Thomas Hopko. Yeah. Thomas Hopko okay. with the icon of Christ on the front. Right. And it just looked very nice. But the English, I remember when I was a teenager, I read the paperback. It was uh -huh. translated by some, some initial French. Oh. Last name was French. Anyway. Could be, could be, yeah. yeah anyway. And so I found it and I read it when I was 14. I was like, that's what I want to do. I want to be like this man. And so I go online and order. Wanderer. I go online and I order a prayer rope and I start saying the Jesus prayer. Um, and then I went to my first Orthodox liturgy when I was uh, 16. And it was just in that moment when I entered the, the church um, in Seattle. It was like I felt immediately like God is in this place. God is here. And we're here to worship God and to give him glory. And it's not about us or about teaching us. It's about God. And this is where I need to be. This is what I've been searching for. And so I was baptized about a year later. How old were you? 17. 17. Yeah, I was still in high school. And um, then I finished um, university with a degree in theology. Uh, and I went to Manton Monastery, to St. John of San Francisco. And I became in a monk. California. Yeah, in California. And I became a monk there. And that's how it began. So that was um, how many years ago? That was in 2010 that I finally left to become a monk. So you've been a monk almost eight years now? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. So how were you, so how was it that you, you ended up in, in Kosovo? It was that the monastery, I'd already been doing um, translation work with a French and ancient Greek and I thought, hey, you know, it'd be great to have someone who can speak Serbian just for Serbian guests and maybe do some translation work. Uh, so they sent me to Serbia to learn the Serbian language and I was studying first in University of Belgrade um, and then I just expressed like a desire to visit Kosovo because I'd heard of the holy places like Dachani, Gracanica and I wanted to see them and so um, Bishop Maxim connected me with my future abbot's mother Danica who lives in Thessaloniki and she was like my son is an abbot in Kosovo and so that was how I got to go visit and I visited all the monasteries and I just felt something very special there. Like immediately when I crossed the border, it was something came alive in my heart. Like I could feel the blood of the martyrs. I could feel the prayers of the people and the holiness of the place. And the monks that I met there, I felt like I had met, I'd known them my whole life. And I felt in my heart like I had become a small child again, um, like renewed. And then when it was time to leave after I was just, I was just, just like a week. Uh, I felt like I was leaving my family behind. Like, how could I ever not see these people again? How could I live my life that way? And so then I was then traveling around a bit more to see monasteries in the Balkans. And I was on Mount Athos for several months. And the whole time all I wanted to do was go back to Kosovo. And so God arranged it that that could happen. You mentioned the blood of the martyrs, but what else drew you to Kosovo? I mean, you know, that's... Uh, I mean, you were there only for one week. Uh, yeah, but, uh, I think it was like the very simple Christian love that I experienced from people. Just this immediate acceptance. And um, I remember one of my first impressions was I came on a Saturday night really late. And then Sunday we had liturgy. And afterwards, 
one of the monks told a joke and everyone starts laughing. And I was like, these people are so normal. I love that. Yeah. Like they have this deep piety and they live in these difficult conditions and yet they can still laugh. They still have joy. Mm-hmm. And just um, the generosity of the local people and their simple love. Like they are simple people and sometimes as an American it can be a bit difficult for me. But at the same time I've learned so much from them about love, about accepting people who are different, about endurance, about patience. Um, in a way, it's like I was, you know, before I was reading books about the fathers and even, even more recent fathers, like St. Paisios, to us in America, it can seem so distant, like a distant world. And how is it like this? How does this make sense? And now in Kosovo, I feel like I've stepped into a world where I, that, I have that context to understand the writings of the fathers and what these virtues are about and how Christians should live, which is in love and in, in prayer, you know. So after your short visit to Kosovo, mm-hmm. you went back to the States? No, I was, I was still in Serbia studying. Oh, so f- and I visited a few more monasteries just sort of like to see them. Mm-hmm. And then I was in, in Greece, in Mount Athos, for a few months. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And it was after that that I went to Kosovo. I didn't have any time back in America. You didn't? You just no. stayed? In yeah, Kosovo. yeah. And the next time I came to America was with Father Lari and Mayavit mm-hmm. on an official visit for the canonization of St. Sebastian in Los Angeles. Do you still have parents in, uh, in Seattle? Uh, my, mo- my mom. Both my parents were alive then. Um, my dad died while I was in Serbia mm-hmm. on Pokrov, which was a blessing, and he was Orthodox. Has your mother ever been to, to Kosovo? She hasn't. She keeps talking about it, but she's just worried, and I don't know why. Um, we're going to meet up in France later this year. Is it because maybe she thinks that it's a very dangerous place? And She does. Because, I mean, like many Americans, what she remembers is the Yugoslav wars of the 90s, which were brutal. And that's what she remembers. So. so it is a dangerous place. Still? It can be. I think it depends a lot on who you are and where you are. Like, the situation can change very locally. I would say that the situation has improved since the war ended in terms of safety. Um, immediately after 1999, that was horrific. Um, but in the last year, it's been starting to get worse again. As there's been more political pressures, people have started to react to that. And there's been a lot more provocations. How are the, how are the service holding up? I mean, are they coming back, some of them, or are they staying away? I mean, what's, what's the situation with, with, the, with the, the people? And I'm not talking, we're not getting to the monastics yet, but mm-hmm. just, just the people. Are they coming back? Very few. Mm-hmm. I mean, because the... Uh, the, the um, Kosovo Albanian population prevented return of Serbs for so long, maybe about 10 years, nobody could really come back. That now, I mean, a lot of them, they have new lives in Serbia, wherever they went. Mm-hmm. Um, I think there are maybe 5,000 or so people who have returned, and most of them are older people who just want to die where they lived. Young, um, young people tend to stay in Serbia. Pretty much. Um, and then people who've stayed the whole time in villages, in isolated enclaves. There's not a lot of economic, economic opportunity. They mostly live off of help from the state and help from the monasteries and like subsistence agriculture. Um, and there's not a lot of future for them. It's a very sad situation. And most of the young people leave. Now, after your travels to Greece, to Mount Athos, mm-hmm. and your studies, you, you settled in Dechini first? No, in Draganats. Right away? Yeah. Um, I was sent to be with Father Ilarion in Draganats because the bishop decided that that would be a good fit. And he was right. Um, we both became monks when we were 21. And we have, I guess, a lot of similarities. And I feel like we really feel each other in our hearts. And um, he himself, he's a very prayerful, holy man who's been through a lot um, of temptations and persecutions. Uh, he survived the war and the bombing and the period in Kosovo when they basically lived like prisoners in the monastery. You couldn't go out at all because it was too dangerous. And he's come out this very tolerant, loving, understanding person. He makes excuses for everyone. And he's taught me how to do that. And uh, he always, you know, he really lives like the, the motto of St. Paisios, you know, be like, be like the bee. Look for the good in everyone and everything. And he's just this bright, radiant personality who I think really knows. He, I, he's one of the first people that I've met that I feel he's teaching me something about prayer that he, he knows, 
not just from a book, but he's learned mm -hmm. through his experience. Right. How many monasteries are there in Kosovo, Orthodox monasteries? Um, you know, in the Middle Ages, there were several hundred, and then over time, of course, they were destroyed by the Muslims. And even before the war in 1999, there were quite a lot more. Now, there are about 15 living monasteries. 15? Yeah, but most of them are in the western region. In the eastern half of Kosovo, we are, we're the only living one since the war. And how many monastics are there in your monastery? We have 12, so we're the second largest brotherhood in Kosovo today. What age group are they? Are they different? Or? Everything from, I mean, it's pretty mixed. It's a good mix. So everything from 29, I'm the youngest in age, mm -hmm. to uh, 60 something. Uh, it's mixed. It's good. It's a good mix. What kind of uh, prayer rule do you lead in the monastery? What kind of, what's, what, what are the daily schedule of the services? And yeah, so um, the morning service begins at five, but before that, we're expected to get up quite a bit earlier to do our cell rules. Um, and then to warm up our hearts, you know, for prayer in the church. And then we do midnight office and matins. And we do liturgy most days. If we don't do liturgy, then we also do the hours and typica. But most days we do liturgy and the brothers commune. Uh, we have daily confession of our thoughts with the abbot as long as he's there. And that's a huge part of our lives, um, cleaning the mind, renewal of the mind. How many higher monks do you have? Just the abbot. Just the abbot. Yeah. So he, he if he's there, he serves every day. Yeah, yeah. Um, and then we go about our work. Uh, the service ends around 9 in the morning. We go about our work. Uh, we make incense. We make crosses. There's a lot of work to be done just keeping a monastery up. We have many, many, many guests every day. Hospitality is a big, hospitality is a big part of our work. Just making people feel accepted, welcome, and showing them the love of Christ. No matter who they are, even the Muslim Albanians who come. And uh, then we have Vespers at uh, four, and we eat again, and then we have a bit of time, we go on walks together, and we have Compline, and then you're, you're done for the day. And on feasts, like Polyle feasts, maybe a couple of times a month, we have vigils during the night where we do uh, Compline all the way through the liturgy, beginning at midnight, and it's become a nice tradition that we really like to do that. Mm -hmm. You say you have many visitors. Mm -hmm. Uh, who, who are they? Serbs mostly or...? We get mostly like Serbs from the local villages who live around us. They come to us for support, both material and spiritual. And we also get a number of visitors like from foreigners who are working in Kosovo for governmental agencies, for NGOs and such things. We get some from like central Serbia and occasionally we get a foreigner, but very rarely, <laughs> unless they're working in Kosovo. And some Albanians too, increasingly mm -hmm. they're finding out about us. How do you get along with the Muslim population? You know, on like a personal level, I think generally it, relations are pretty good. Like we have many friends who are Muslims and they come and they congratulate us on feasts and we share the joy together. Um, we have an Albanian teacher who comes and teaches the monks Albanian because we want to learn to engage the people in their language and show them that we love them. That's the way to, you know, show someone you care. Take the time, learn their language. Um, and so you, I think, and you, and you do speak Albanian. Yeah, I've been learning it for two years now, so I can communicate okay with them. And Serbian. Yeah. And French. Yeah. Um, and English, sort of. <laughs> <laughs> and um, so I would say, on the whole, we have pretty positive relations with our with our neighbors in our region. We're very fortunate. In like in Metohija, that's not the case. But yet, there are so many provocations, especially increasing the last year or so. Um, where people just sort of shout at us in the streets, like last fall they were shouting at us, kill the Serbs, kill the Serbs. Is that because Serbia is trying to reinsert, re-exert itself somehow in the, in the region? Or? I don't think so. I don't mm. see Serbia doing that. I see Serbia cooperating fully with the West and with the peace process. I think it's just that for a long time Serbia was a scapegoat for Albanian Muslims and their problems in society because it's a poor country. And oftentimes pe people seek a reason why that's easy. And for them, it's been Serbs. But also, I think they're, for hundreds of years, they've had this hatred towards Orthodox Christianity. Um, I translated recently a book of Ottoman Turkish documents, so a Muslim source, detailing the persecutions of Albanians against Orthodox Christians in Kosovo. And so it's going back hundreds of years. It's not a new thing. It's almost, I don't, 
understand hatred, to be honest. I don't understand it. But you definitely feel it. A lot of it is just, they want to make you feel that you're not welcome and they don't want you here. Mm -hmm. um, those, yeah. Do Orthodox from other countries like Poland or uh, Russia or Romania come to visit? Very occasionally. Mm -hmm. um, they come more to Dechini or Gachani, to yeah. the bigger monasteries. We're sort of a mountain monastery hidden away, not so known. Occasionally we get some. Um, How old is your monastery? Well, it was founded in the Middle, Age Middle Ages at some point. We're not quite sure when. We think it was probably founded by Hezekas who were fleeing the Turks into then Christian Serbia. There are many, many cases of this. Um, archaeological evidence shows that our monastery is sort of like the, the main church for scattered skeets that were in the woods. Um, but the monastery is first mentioned in 1381 as being an endowment of uh, Prince Lazar. He named it after his daughter Dragana, but it's dedicated to holy archangels. And uh, it continued quite well until... Is that why it's called the Rurmanets? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Which in Serbian, it's sort of, the connotation is beloved. So it's like mm -hmm. a beloved place. Mm -hmm. And uh, so then it continued on until 1455 when the Turks came. And we're pretty sure it just kind of was extinguished at that point. And then, but those, you know, those seeds of prayer of the, the monks at the time, they didn't remain fallow. And the local Serbian population reestablished the monastery in 1863. And there were always just a couple of monks there uh, about the next century. It never became something big, but it was there continuing on the prayers of the church and life of the church continued on. And, uh, but after World War II, then communism came. And actually the last monk to live in Draganets was a Russian, Father Grigory, who's remembered as being a very holy man. And then the, mon the monks of Dechny Monastery reestablished Draganets in 2000, and Father Ilarion was sent in 2010, and that's when it really began to breathe and grow, and the spiritual life was reestablished. So you uh, financed the operations of the monastery by making incense. Mm -hmm. uh, you make wooden icons as well. Wooden icons, wooden mm -hmm. crosses, incense. We do book translations. We produce a lot of our own food. Um, we started to make products out of. Um, Clay, like we started to make incense burners out of clay. They're very common in Serbia. I haven't really seen them in America yet, but we're hoping to sell those. Mm -hmm. uh, but who, who buys these things? I mean, so you're in such a remote place. I mean, yeah, I mean, that's the problem. We're so remote, and mostly the visitors we get are the local people who are looking to us for help. And so... And you help them. And we do help them. Mm -hmm. we, we get help, I mean, from, from some foreign agencies, some from the state, that goes but to the people. Um, we get a lot of help from Solidarité Kosovo, it's a French organization, and from Amici di Decini, it's an Italian organization. But as far as our products, I mean, so that's why we started our website that's online now, uh, dragonetsmonastery.com. And it's been online since February, and it's actually been going quite well. We're really impressed with the response from um, Christians in Western Europe and in America, Canada and Australia. I think that's really kind of becoming our lifeline um, because otherwise it's like we can work with our hands as much as we want but locally there's no one who can afford to buy those things. Um, they need help from us and, th and if people in the West can help us, we can help them even more. Now you mentioned translations. What uh, sort of translations do you do? You do? Uh, they're, so far they've been primarily like a historical text about Kosovo and how Christians have lived in Kosovo for the past 500 years. Um, also some liturgical translations and just short articles and talks and such things. Uh, most of we give them as gifts actually to diplomats and to foreigners who come to explain to them the situation. You can buy them, I think, in Dutch and English Chinese, but mostly we give them away. Um, and yeah, and then the translations, we do some that for Pravoslavia.ru's English site. I've done some for them, yes, translations. For Mother uh, Cornelia. Yeah, with yes, her. Yeah. Um, yeah. And I'm also friends with Jesse Dominic, who also works with her over there mm -hmm. in Moscow. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we, I've, uh, we're, we're beginning a, col a collaboration with them on that. Do you have plans to come with Father Hilaire into the States and uh, speak more about uh, Kosovo and Orthodoxy there and your monastery and the life of Orthodox Christians? We don't have any concrete plans right now, but this all went so amazingly well. We were so 
overwhelmed by the response of people and how interested they were that we would really like, we would really hope to be able mm-hmm. to, and for Father Lauren to come next time too, I think would be a big blessing mm-hmm. for the people. So may God grant, you know. Well, may God grant that the next time we meet, uh, we'll be with Father Lodion in front of the camera and uh, yes. uh, do our next interview. Yes, thank God. Father, thank you so much and uh, yeah. God bless you and keep us in your prayers. We will keep us in yours and thank you so much for this opportunity. Yeah.